Well, what I'm building for the Ultimate Craftsman Project is an 8-8 teardrop style pintail. My name is Mark Andrini. I'm 63 years old. I was raised in Santa Barbara, California and then returned to the place of my birth, which is the Bay Area, where I've been living since about 1980. Is that my good side? All right, for this where, one... Which is my good side? this one, look at the camera, though. The, the Makaha-style board emanated and evolved from the Hawaiians, and it's well documented that a group of guys, which includes George Downing, narrowed the tails and the nose and made a real sleek beautiful outline with the wide point way up forward and that teardrop outline they used them in bigger waves and at that period in time going into the 40s Makaha was the big wave venue these beautiful sleek boards. Well George Downing is the one that I, I really believe was so well known for writing that spot and he added a fin to the board, pulled it in a little more, made it into a pintail, dropped the rails down in the back and over time that became the platform for the big wave board. Then in the short board era there was a number of people who were involved in that, but Dick Brewer was also building a Makaha style board. He called it the Pipeliner. They're probably nine foot, eight inches long at that point. Downings were mostly 10 feet long. But when the shortboard era came, they simply, and I say they, Brewer is one of the main people who did that, shortened that beautiful Makaha style gun down to about eight foot, eight inches and uh, they actually started at nine foot six and worked down to about eight eight and that became known as the minigun but the minigun really evolved from the Makaha style board and so I've blended the uh, the displacement hull style of board with the rocker and the outline of the Makaha style boards from that era and over time have my own version of that style of board but it's a combination of those two items and that's what uh, I'm building. Well, the materials that I used to make this board were foam, redwood, fiberglass, and resin. Now, the only thing traditional about that list would probably be the redwood because that's been in use at least since the turn of the 19th century. I had some old blanks that were made during the transition from Clark foam to our now modern blank manufacturers like US blanks that I use today. And there was all kinds of old really crummy blanks floating around and I bought a bunch of them. And uh, I had some in my attic to waste them so I thought well I'm going to take one out and use that. Uh, they didn't have the correct rocker in them so I know I'm going to have to redo that so I took a piece of redwood from my deck that I'd taken apart in the backyard of my house and was saving it for a rainy day so I made a stringer out of that that I could put the correct rocker in for the type of board that I wanted to build. So that's where I started is a redwood plank from my deck and a blank that nobody would want that I cut in half and put a new stringer in. So it starts there. So after the stringer's made, then of course you cut the blank in half, take away the old stringer and glue it back together with a new one. I've just used resin because that's what's laying around. I've done it with wood glue, I've done it with epoxy, I've done it with any kind of resin. I just use whatever's in my garage. I just happen to have some laminating resin that works really well so I just put a little white pigment in it so if there's any voids you won't see them because it'll match the blank and you just clamp it together you just have to make sure that you get just enough material so that when you squeeze it together it squishes it out and takes the air out with it there so you won't have air bubbles later for when you're glassing because those will blow up through your glass job and make a mess and I think people don't understand is that 
it doesn't really matter how you cut that board out. What matters is, is that in your mind you have an exact vision of what it's supposed to look like when it's finished. Because when I'm looking at the board, I may be running around and hacking away, but I am looking for it to come into focus of exactly what's in my mind. So in my mind, I know exactly what it's supposed to look like. It has to have all the curves intersect. The roll in the bottom is the deepest where the board is the widest and where the rocker peaks the most. It all comes together. It's very visual for me. I know what it's supposed to look like. I don't worry about measuring. So you put in your rocker and then you blend your rail down. And uh, the whole time you're doing it, it's about a, a vision. That's number one more important than technique doesn't matter. You could use a chisel and a rock and it would take you a week to do it. But if you know what it is that you want to end up with, you'll end up with the same result. The tools just make it faster or slower. The template that I used is made exactly for the board that I built. So it has the right amount of base and the right amount of depth and the right amount of rake. And I put some wax paper down on a piece of plywood and started laying it up. You can't do it all or it'll get too hot because resin gets hot when it's catalyzed. So I did it in sections. But I just don't like to waste anything, so I used what I had. But I mainly just wanted to get a nice, even, simple foil and uh, have my line. is that will pretty much stay the way it is. So that should be good. That should work. That's what we were hoping for. So really, fin making is more about knowing why you're making the fin and what the fin's going to look like. So I ended up using a seven and a half ounce bull end. The function of a surfboard is it needs to work a certain way, but you want it to evoke a certain feeling for you personally. And for me, I picked the color design straight off of one of my favorite photographs. It's either a Leroy Granis or a Jeff Devine. I'll have to check that out. But it's the finalist at the Sunset Beach Duke Hanamoku Invitational from 1969. And Jock Sutherland and Nat Young and Kanaya Puni uh, are walking down the beach, and Joey Cabell, one of my favorite surfers of all time. And then there's Ben Ipa, and he's carrying aboard a 9.6 teardrop pintail, just like that, and it's the identical colors. Some of the color is done in the fiberglass, and some of it is applied straight to the foam. It depends on where you want it to go. If it's in the fiberglass, then it has to go where the fiberglass goes. So the yellow is on the bottom wrapping around to the deck where you have a piece of tape and you trim it. So it gives you a nice contrast to the outline of the board. The reason I explain that I do it with a single piece of tape is so that I can get and trim my lap like this. But the blue, in the old days, well, we did a lot of airbrush in the 70s, and I liked airbrushing. But we also did what's called foam staining, which I don't think is done anymore. But you take resin and you mix the color in it, in this case that steel blue color, and you stain the foam. You pour it on the foam and you squeegee it in. You have to do it several times to make it even. And it's really cool. It looks kind of like an airbrush, but it's a little bit richer. But it's actually catalyzed resin. So it takes time and it's a little messy, but it's an old school method that, that I really like. So I decided to do it that way. One of the harder parts of making a board, it's really hard physical labor to sand them. And the sander is so important in the process because they recreate your shape. So I greatly appreciate all the sanders uh, that contribute to the industry. So anyway, I re have to recreate my shape, which is easy for me because I already know what, it, what it's supposed to look like. 
and then it's off to the uh, crossing room for pin lines. So I do old school pin lines. I know there's lots of different paints and inks that are used today that are much quicker and simpler. Uh, but in our day, uh, you use resin. I just did black and white to match my fin because I have a black fin with a white center. So I want it all to tie together. So you lay your tape and brush your coat on and pull the tape before it gels because you get a cleaner line that way. The other thing, of course, was making the logo. I just went to the art store, bought some tracing paper, a bunch of uh, ink pens and, you know, whatever they had to see what would work. And then I tested it all with resin. And the resin melted everything except one white paint pen and pencil. <laughs> so, so I knew that I got to make a logo out of that. So I just came up with a, you know, a simple design and just went with it. That's how we used to do it in the old days. For me, that was the hardest part of the entire surfboard project, was having to polish it. First of all, the polisher that I had to use was, it had to weigh 20 pounds. I could barely walk for two days after picking that thing. And it's 5,000 RPM, which is just in frickin' insanity to put that onto a surfboard with one layer of fiberglass on it. But anyway, I'm really thankful I got through it and finished the project without throwing the board off the rack and against the wall and having to start over.